All right, and as folks trickle in, uh, I'll give folks maybe another 30 seconds and we'll start. All right, in the interest of time, I'm going to get started uh, since we only have an hour for the session. So if you can come in, uh, please find a seat. So hello everyone, this is paper session six on racial bias, uh, which runs from uh, now for an hour. We have a lineup of five incredible papers uh, from friends, colleagues, and researchers I look up to who you'll hear from over the next hour. Uh, I'm Well Santo, the chair for this session and as someone who focuses on critical race and digital studies, um, I'm actually personally very, very excited to hear their talks and the following Q&A. Um, some house administrivia. So each paper talk will be 10 minutes, and I've been given instructions to be extremely strict uh, with keeping time. Um, so I'll be notifying the speakers at two minutes. Uh, you'll see the sign. I'll be sitting right here in the front. Um, at one minute, I have this cute little yellow keyboard case. Um, so at one minute, I'll hold this up so you can see you have one minute left. Um, we are being live streamed onto Hopin. Uh, thank you to all the virtual viewers. Uh, and the only way for online participants to hear us is if we speak into these microphones. Uh, so speakers will be asked to stay by this podium. Um, and if folks online can't hear any of the speakers at any time, please do comment that into Hopin chat. Um, and with Q&As, we'll be passing around the microphones so that people online can hear questions as well. Um, after all five talks have been given, that's when we'll have a collective Q&A for everyone. Uh, so do hold your questions until then. Uh, for folks in the room, we'll ask you to come up either to the podium here or we do have one microphone we can run around with. Um, alternately, if you're online or if you don't want to come up and speak in person, uh, you can enter your question to hop in's Q&A tab uh, anytime. So without further ado, we'll start our first talk from Amina Abdu on an empirical analysis of racial categories in the algorithmic fairness literature. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, like Well said, I'm Amina Abdu, um, and I'm excited to present uh, work today with my co-authors Irena Pasquato and Abigail Jacobs uh, called An Empirical Analysis of Racial Categories in the Algorithmic Fairness Literature. Um, so to motivate this talk, I want to convince you first that you should care about racial classification and second that you should care in particular about um, the algorithmic fairness setting as a place where racial classification occurs. So racial classification is important because it has material consequences for how political, cultural, um, economic, and social resources are allocated. And it's also important in this community because anti-discrimination efforts like those undertaken by the algorithmic fairness community requires identifying groups that suffer from discrimination. But this requires care, uh, specifically because classification has been weaponized uh, toward a variety of ends, oftentimes um, reinforcing or furthering uh, existing racial hierarchies. And I could point to a number of examples um, from historical cases, but I wanna point out that this is not only in the past. For example, the state of Louisiana is currently um, undertaking efforts to disenfranchise black voters by reclassifying um, multiracial black residents as non-black. Um, and the last thing I want to say here is that institutions play a really important role in racial classification, um, and in particular, scientific institutions and the state have played um, a really important historical role. And now, uh, we propose that algorithmic fairness um, is emerging as a new and important race-making institution uh, with two particular characteristics. 
First, the formal nature of algorithmic fairness means that race categories have to be really explicitly quantified um, and operationalized, which sort of crystallizes racial categories in new ways. Um, and also, algorithmic fairness largely is taking place outside of the legal system, um, but still has important policy impacts. So decisions that might have previously been in the hands of traditional policymakers or domain experts is moving toward technologists. Um, and other people have also found this setting interesting. Um, and so there have been a number of really great uh, critiques of rac racial categories in the algorithmic fairness community already. Um, and these critiques center on two key issues. First, uh, the algorithmic fairness community's tendency to treat race as individual rather than relational. And second, their tendency to treat race as fixed rather than contextual. Um, and this critical literature points to two sort of key uh, influences that have shaped uh, algorithmic fairness practices uh, in negative ways. So first, the uncritical adoption of legal conceptions of race, and second, the uncritical adoption of biological conceptions of race. Um, and despite this really great uh, critical literature, we argue that there's some stuff that's still missing. So namely, we think an empirical analysis is important to understand how racial classification plays out in practice within this community. Um, and second, the critical literature has tended to sort of assume that uh, the algorithmic fairness community is just uncritically reproducing what's already been institutionalized elsewhere, uh, rather than examining the algorithmic fairness community um, as its own sort of setting with its own norms and practices. Um, so we'd like to look into that. Um, so that brings us to our research questions. First, how are racial categories operationalized and conceptualized in the algorithmic fairness literature? Um, second, how are these decisions justified? And finally, how do values appear alongside these decisions? Uh, so to answer these questions, um, we do qualitative content analysis of fact papers, and we look specifically at papers um, which mention fairness or related keywords in their abstract, so papers that are sort of substantially about fairness. Um, and the papers have to mention race at least somewhere um, within the text, so this would exclude, for example, papers uh, that are about fairness but only in the context of gender. Um, and then based on this, we create an iterative qualitative coding scheme to sort of answer our questions. Um, and that brings us to our results. So going back to our first question, how are racial categories operationalized and conceptualized? Well, we find a lot of variations. So racial classification schemas vary between papers, but also sometimes even within the same paper. Um, and even the most common schema, which is treating race as sort of either black or white, is only used in about 18% of uh, the papers that we looked at. And conceptualizations of race, race more broadly also vary. So we do see race conceptualized as a legal category, which we might expect given um, the critical literature. But this is still only like about half of papers. We also see race conceptualized as a social status category or even as sort of a really abstract sensitive attribute that's kind of interchangeable with any number of other um, variables within the data. And there are lots more. Um, there are details on that in the paper. That brings us to our second question. Uh, how are these decisions justified? Um, and simply, like most papers don't justify their decisions. Uh, among our papers that we looked at, only about a fifth of them pre presented any kind of justification. Um, but we still think it's useful to look at the papers that do present some sort of justification for lessons on where to go next. So to that end, we present a taxonomy of justifications. Um, and so we see a whole host of sort of practical considerations, things like technical constraints, data availability, and epistemic concerns like um, reliability, consistency, and objectivity. Uh, but I want to focus really on contextual relevance-based uh, justifications because we think this is promising about where we can go next. Um, so contextual relevance justifications focus on you know, either the uh, political and geographic context um, or uh, sort of the application domain context um, as reasons that a particular racial classification schema is relevant for the problem at hand. Um, and this helps us sort of address this critique of a contextual and under-theorized uh, conceptions of race and um, can help us make sure that our interventions are aligned with our goals. 
Um, and that brings us to our final question, how do values appear alongside race categories? Um, I won't go into much detail here, but we find that values are differentially expressed through different conceptualizations of race. Um, and so we point to the importance of visibility practices around um, the operationalization of race to help surface the values um, embedded within algorithmic fairness research. And that brings us to our discussion. So some reminders from the literature. Uh, we know that the critiques of algorithmic fairness have centered on legal, uh, the problems of legal and biological conceptions of race. And they've also focused on these problems of acontextual and under-theorized operationalizations of race, which we also find through this sort of persistent lack of justification. Um, from the broader racial classification literature, we know that classification is political and shaped by institutions, which hopefully can help point us towards some interventions. Um, so our big finding here is really that there's a lot of heterogeneity in race categories and values. So legal frameworks are prominent, which we would have expected given the critical literature, but they're far from the only story. Um, for example, we also see that computer science values and norms are really influential in shaping um, algorithmic fairness practices around racial classification. Um, and these differences are not necessarily bad. Um, it's in fact, could be good to have heterogeneity given the situated and contextual nature of race, um, but it's really hard to examine these critically given the current lack of justification. And this is important because operationalization decisions matter. Um, based on our findings and the literature, we know that values are embedded in these operationalization decisions, um, and race categories have historically been manipulated toward um, various ends, so the significant flexibility and lack of justification that we see is really troubling. Um, and as a path forward, uh, I want to talk about the importance of institutions once again. So we draw on the work of Hannah Brown about the, these three key factors uh, that are, shape racialization practices um, in the state context. So evidentiary standards, record keeping requirements, and incentives. And I want to note that these also exist within the algorithmic fairness community uh, through publishing standards, documentation requirements, um, corporate influence and publishing incentives. Um, and so based on that, we think that there's a really exciting opportunity for the algorithmic fairness community and the institutions within it, such as FACT, um, to really take steps toward reshaping these three key factors uh, toward the sort of interventions that we want to see to make sure that they're aligned with our values. Um, and I'll end here with this news from Nature about um, sort of steps taken in other publishing institutions that we might follow. Thank you. All right, up next we have datafication genealogies beyond algorithmic fairness, making up of racialized subjects. And I'll let them introduce themselves. Um. Hello everyone, my name is Anna Valdivia and I'm presenting today this paper on datification genealogies co-authored together with uh, Martina Tazzioli. So datification is to datify a phenomenon um, to put it in a quantified format so it can be tabulated and analyzed. Yet datification is not only about translating social phenomena and people into data, it is also about creating and crafting racialized subjects. Far from being a neutral and objective mechanism, datification has historically served for constructing, recording, and classifying individuals through racialized profiles. This paper argues that, first, datification per se should not be narrowed to digitalization and thus to algorithmic discrimination. An exclusive focus on algorithmic fairness dehistoricizes datification as a recent phenomenon and conceptualizes social injustice in terms of automatic discrimination. Second, it contends that critiques of racial categories in algorithmic fairness should move forward by considering datification as an historical mechanism that also reproduces racial profiling. The production of racialized subjects through datification does not necessarily require an algorithmic process or a racial feature. 
This paper retraces a genealogy of datification, but looking at the, at the ways in which people's mobility has been datified in the colony and at the border before the digitalization era. Specifically, we focus on two case studies that foreground how datification historically has been used to produce racialized subjects as well as racialized hierarchies of mobility. The British Empire, profiling through biometrics and statistical methods in the colony, and the police identification practices at the French-Italian border. The border is the site for excellence and which datification is enacted by state authorities to identify people and to multiply hierarchies of undesired mobility. Our paper contributes to the FAC community by illustrating the importance of situa situating digital datification processes within a longer history that also considers analog datification. Indeed, the racialized mechanism of datification cannot merely be reduced to algorithmic-driven procedures, not to racial categories embedded in datasets. Classification serves to multiply racialized bordering mechanisms and hierarchies of mobility. By focusing on the socio-political context, it is possible to grasp how individuals at times manage to dodge, twist, or hack modes of identification through datification. Instead of asking how colonized subjects or migrants are datified in the colony and at the border, it is a question of shifting attention towards how individuals have been enacted as colonized subjects or migrants through identification and classification, which rely on datifi datifying procedures such as fingerprints. This paper intervenes in debates about the datification of mobility, showing that reproduction of hierarchies of mobility in the colony and at the border is paradigmatic of how datification has been used to enforce racializing processes. Despite the attention that biometric systems have recently attracted in current debates on surveillance and migration control, scientific methods have been developed since the 19th century to datify and extract patterns of colonized and marginalized subjects by states and empires. Through colonization, Britain extracted resources and imposed ways of governing on its colonized territories. Francis Galton, a Victorian scholar, play a key role in this scenario by fueling biometrics, statistics, and anthropomorphic measurements for the making of a civic society. An examination of Galto's archive reveals that he studied the use of fingerprints for classifying human races and identification and search purposes arguing that individuals in the colonies were illiterate, deceitful, or similar looking, he advocated for the use of fingerprints to enhance the efficiency of identification processes in the British colonies. Moreover, this archive brings evidence of the connection between science, racism, and the British Empire through the datification of human bodies that began at the colony and was extended to the birth of eugenics. In the 19th century, datification of bodies and other socioeconomic features were instrumentalized by scientists and states by imposing their despotic theories and rules in order to govern undesirable and marginalized subjects an effect that resonates with nowadays large-scale biometric databases for migration control in the European border regime. So the French-Italian border has historically been a key crossing point, and since 1861, when the frontier line between France and Italy was established, it progressively became a high police border. Illegalized border crossers from different nationalities started to be systematically identified and classified by the French police at the Italian border in the late 20s and in a more robust way in the late 30s with the arrival of Jewish escapees from Eastern Europe. The unauthorized border crossers at that time were Italian fugitives such as communists, socialist partisans, Italian workers without permit to expatriate, Jewish refugees, and in the 50s and in the 60s, political dissidents from Romania, Bulgaria, Hungary, Poland, and mostly from Yugoslavia. In the 70s, the first migrants from North African countries and from the Middle East had been found by the French police as well as by both Italian and French mountain rescuers. 
In this paper, we build on archival records to retrace how migrants were datified at the border after being stopped by the French police. Importantly, the genealogy of datification of migrants' mobility at the French-Italian border that can be retraced depends on the data that authorities collect and extracted from unauthorized border crossers, and therefore is necessarily a partial and incomplete genealogy. <clears throat> Indeed, many migrants were not detected by the police, and hence their passage does not appear in any archive. It is worth noticing that police practices of racialization through classification do have a consolidated colonial genealogies, both in the colonies and in France, towards former colonized populations, such as, for instance, Algerians. Hence, a genealogical approach foregrounds historical partial continuities between racialization through datification at the borders and in the urban post-colonial space. The datification of unauthorized border crossers conducted by the French police in the last centuries was quite similar to the current procedure. Indeed, the identification form filled in by French police officers included personal data of migrants, reason for going to France, job skills, and ink fingerprints. Nevertheless, datification of undesired mobility at the border should not lead us to conclude that state authorities conduct exhaustive controls and registration practices. On the contrary, both nowadays and in the past, this is characterized by partial no recording and no registration. So moving towards discussion, datification has been historically enforced by nation states to identify undesirable and deceitful subjects and to make them reliable and knowledgeable. This is nowadays strengthened through the use of large-scale systems implemented at the border to control migration and to block people on the move. Alongside quantitative shifts, it generated also qualitative changes. First, algorithmic datification enforces new modes of discrimination based on factors that work as indirect indicators and markers and that are the result of recombinant identities. Second, algorithmic datification is eminently future-oriented. So, our conclusion. <clears throat> In this paper, we draw attention to the racialization mechanism that datification has historically generated. Datification did not start with the rise of digitalization and with artificial intelligence, although it is not a matter of a full continuity between past and present. A genealogical approach highlights partial continuities and shifts between analog and digital datification. Our genealogical approach invites the fact community to move beyond the techno-focused critique of algorithmic unfairness and to situate the analysis of bias and discrimination within a broader account of the exclusionary laws and policies that definitification is used for by the states. This paper does not offer policy recommendation, nor does it endorse a problem-solving approach. On the contrary, it suggests that instead of focusing exclusively on criticizing algorithmic bias, scholars should reverse the standpoint by scrutinizing how specific datification mechanisms are put in place to enforce exclusionary legal political measures that are rooted in history. Thank you very much. Up next. All right, up next, we have how redundant are redundant encodings, blindness in the wild, and racial disparity when race is unobserved with Ling Wei Cheng. Let me load this up. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Ling Wei. Uh, I'm from Carnegie Mellon University. I'm presenting the work, How Redundant Are Redundant Encodings, Blindness in the Wild, and Racial Disparity. <coughs> Sorry, when <laughs> race is unobserved. This is joint work with Isabel Galagos, who's an equal contributing co-author, and Derek Ouyang, Jacob Godin, Daniel Hall from Stanford University Reg Lab. So um, racial equity assessment is critical to our understanding of the policy impact on disadvantaged groups. This point is emphasized in the 2021 executive order on advancing racial equity and support for under, <clears throat> underserved communities through the federal government. So in the order, uh, it is required that all federal agencies conduct racial equity assessment in order to um, eliminate, prevent, and reduce uh, racial bias in their programs. However, um, there is a lack <clears throat> However, uh, there is a lack of reported race, which poses as a significant challenge to conducting such racial disparity assessment. So this can happen when agencies um, do not collect race in fear that 
it might prevent people from seeking services due to, stigmatiz due to stigmatization. And some agencies are also explicitly prohibited from um, collecting race for precisely, um, you know, not to, in order to not to, um, sorry, discriminate based on the basis of race. So um, given that there's often no self-reported self -reported race in this data set, um, what's the alternative? One popular alternative is using a BIF, BISG, or Bayesian Improved Surname and Geocoding. This is the current state of art that people use to impute race. It uses um, probabilistic priors, um, first name, surname, and geographic locations, and calculate, um, and it, it infers your race based on a naive Bayes calculation. However, this, this method is known to be subject to statistical bias that can over or underestimate the level of disparity and it violates, um, and it makes strong independent assumption that's often violated in practice. So in reality, we also often have rich data besides just name and geographic locations, particularly in healthcare and medical settings. So one question is, how do we leverage the richness of the data to improve race imputation? Now, as we're adding more and more features for our imputation, uh, another important question uh, occurs, that is the question of redundant codings. So in the textbook example, if we have a feature set, um, each, each feature that is with features that's each correlated with sensitive attributes such as race, as the size of the feature set increases, the probability that the classifier will accurately classify race um, becomes, uh, increases and approaches one. <clears throat> So uh, this notion that the bigger the data, the higher the risk of redundant coding is a central concern in privacy and algorithmic fairness. However, we know very little about uh, this problem in practice. So our research questions uh, focus on um, those two problems. So one, can we improve imputation of race using machine learning based approach? And secondly, you know, how does this inform our understanding of redundant coding? Uh, we then look into the impact of using the machine learning based approach to disaggregate broader racial categories and how does that perform for different racial groups. So to answer the question, we use uh, American Family Cohort data set, which contains about 8 million electronic health records um, for US patients from 2010 to, pre to the present. It includes, it includes population, uh, sorry, it includes, it, uh, <clears throat> Um, it inclu in includes population um, from the rural area, uh, low income, and racial minorities. Um, this data set is uniquely suited for us to answer the question because it contains first name, last name, and geographic locations. It also contains self-reported race, uh, which we can use to assess the performance of the imputation, and most importantly, it contains highly granular health information. So here you can see all the features that we derived. So we have about a thousand, uh, over 1,200 features, and we rank them by the accessibility to researchers. So in the baseline features, we have the name and geographic locations, and um, then we have demographic, behavioral, administrative, general health, and medical information. So we know that uh, in practice, most, most of the time, it's actually very difficult to have access to first name and last name geographic locations. So in our appendix, we also discuss, you know, um, what happens when you have an anonymized data set. Okay, again, the two approaches we're comparing is the conventional BIFSG, that is a naive based calculation using those priors, and then for the machine learning approach, we take a supervised approach learning, a supervised approach um, that uses a random forest, and we train six different models, starting from the baseline features, and then gradually adding all the other um, medical features that we derived. So uh, I'll start going over the results. Um, how does machine learning approach improve the imputation of race compared to the BIFSG baseline? So we use two um, metrics, AUPRC and AUROC. And we use AUPRC, that is the area under the precision recall curve, because prior studies have shown in this type of problem when the data set is extremely imbalanced, you can have models that perform uh, equivalently on AUROC, but have very different performance on AUPRC, which focuses more on the positive instances. And we look at the performance uh, at the both micro and macro level. 
<clears throat> so here you can see that the machine learning approach outperforms conventional BIFSG uh, across the metrics and across the two different levels. To break it down further, we look at where are we getting um, the performance gain. So you can see that um, we, the machine learning approach performs much better um, for racial minorities, minorities uh, than for the majority group. Okay. So um, in the second question, um, we want to understand how redundant uh, actually are redundant encodings in the wild. To do so, as mentioned before, we train six different models, starting from baseline and then gradually adding in uh, the other features we derived from the electronic health records. So the rounded dots show the performance of the increasing sets, and then the X crosses shows the performance of the individual sets. So um, as you can see, the dotted lines trend slightly upwards but stay relatively flat. So this shows we only have a very, we only have a very small performance gain um, by adding in those additional features. And this small performance in, um, and this small boosting in performance is surprising for several reasons. Um, uh, one, it goes on to show that it, when we talk about um, redundant encoding, it's less so about the size of the feature set, more about the quality of the feature set, because in this case, um, the baseline features with just name and geographic location um, performs the best, um, seems to be the most highly relevant features. And secondly, in contrast to the textbook example, we show that each additional feature is not an independent signal um, of, of race. And uh, lastly, I think the result tempers our concerns on, um, uh, on redundant encoding that um, the larger the feature set, the higher the risk. Um, okay. And then we want to understand if the ML approach can disaggregate broader racial categories and make more precise estimates for subgroups. So here I show you two examples um, when we look at asthma and obesity. So in the 1997 OMB revision, it further breaks down API categories into Asian and Native Hawaiian Pacific Islanders. Um, <clears throat> and you can see that the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander categories, they are twice more likely to be diagnosed with asthma and obesity. However, because conventional BIFSG method relies on um, relies on API priors provided by the census, it's unable to break down uh, this API category further. However, because we have the ground truth labels for those two groups, we can build machine learning uh, models to predict directly for them, and they do produce um, more uh, precise uh, estimates. Okay, lastly, we want to understand um, if machine learning approach performs equally well for different racial groups. Um, here, the size of the circle responds to the size of the population and uh, the transparency responds to the richness of the feature set that we use. So for example, when we look at the black population, we see that as we add in more features, it improves in, both, uh, in terms of both precision and recall. However, it does not improve very much for the majority group and for Hispanic group, um, as we add in more features, the recall remains about the same, whereas the precision improves. So. Um, yeah, in summary, we find that BIFSG inputs lead to performance improvements driven by improved imputation for minority groups. Uh, redundant encodings are less a function of the size of the data than of specific uh, inform informative inputs. Okay, thank you. All right, next up we have Dr. Robin Brewer with Envisioning Equitable Speech Technologies for Black Older Adults. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Robin Brewer, and I wanted to start by acknowledging that the work that I'm presenting today uh, was done with Christina Harrington and Courtney Heldreth while at Google. 
So to start, uh, older adults are adopting voice and speech technologies like Amazon Alexa and Google Assistant because they can be more accessible than visual or screen-based technologies, specifically for people who are experiencing late life vision loss or those with motor disabilities. Um, so these disabilities can make it hard to see a screen on a computer or a mobile device or navigate with a small keyboard or a touch screen or even a mouse. Um, and even beyond disability, older adults can also perceive interacting by voice to be more personal than doing so by text. However, technology is not neutral, and older adults can face challenges with voice technologies when age intersects with other identities uh, like race and ethnicity. So Christina's, Christina's prior work shows how black older adults feel as though they have to modify how they speak so that voice technologies can understand them when searching for health information or essentially engage in what is called code switching. Other work has described challenges that black people experience with voice technologies, showing that the average word error rate across voice assistants, across different brands of voice assistants, is much higher for black speakers than white speakers. Which leads us to this question of not only is this fair, but more importantly, what is fair? So when we were starting this project, we looked to a lot of fact and other fairness literature to learn how researchers were defining fairness. And much of what we found was very quantitative uh, in nature using formulas, different formulas to define uh, what fairness means. More recent concepts like group fairness uh, are used to define how fairness can be different depending on different subgroup characteristics. So motivated by work that recognizes that fairness is not this universal concept, um, calls for community-based approaches to fairness, and then also calls to understand AI harms beyond fairness, we pose two main questions in our work. So the first is, how do black older adults expect voice technologies to respond in equitable and culturally responsive ways? And then how do black older adults operationalize or define fairness, representation, and inclusivity with both voice technologies and AI technologies? So to do this research, we partnered with the Healthier Black Elder Center in Detroit, Michigan. Um, Christina and I have both partnered with this center previously as their goal is to involve more black older adults in research to create more equitable outcomes that consider race, ethnicity, and age. And then we partnered with HBEC, not only for recruitment, but also for advising, aligning with these community-based research principles where knowledge isn't created solely by the researchers, but truly comes from members of the community. So we worked with HBEC to form a community advisory board of older adults who informed early research questions and objectives, provided feedback on materials and recruitment, and also we discussed initial findings with them and how to disseminate or to share uh, this research. So once we established this partnership, we worked with HBEC to recruit 16 black older adults across three different phases or components of the research. We engaged them in two design workshops and one post interview. So in the first design workshop, we asked them about their existing experiences with voice assistants. They created storyboards about moments of conflict that they experienced or that they expected to experience when using voice assistants. And then we also probed whether voice assistants should be aware of any aspects of their identity. In the second workshop, we focus on these three concepts, fairness, representation, and inclusivity, and we engage participants in a series of word mapping exercises and a, a fill-in-the-blank activity of what these concepts um, would be like in artificial intelligence and both um, artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence and voice assistants. And both of these workshops were conducted in person in a small group format with about six to nine uh, participants in each workshop, depending on their availability. And then shortly after these workshops, Christina and I conducted individual remote post interviews with participants and asked about any additional content that they wanted to share outside of the group setting. 
So next, I'll discuss three main findings from the paper, and there are more uh, in the paper, but for time purposes, I'll start with one that is about understanding cultural and regional knowledge. So from activities in the first workshop, participants described how they expected voice technologies to work in certain cases. So when they were asking for questions about directions or if they wanted to be able to control uh, music playback. Um, but they had very low expectations for a voice assistance to appropriately respond to questions about cultural and regional knowledge. So for example, um, I have here on the slide two participants who were engaging in a, a role-playing exercise during the storyboarding activity and stated that Alexa might not know, quote, all the cultural stuff. So a person could ask it, what is June Juneteenth? And Alexa would not understand and ask them to rephrase. And then the person would ask again, and Alexa would uh, respond that it's the name of a Richard Wright novel, um, instead of knowing to respond with details about it being a holiday, an upcoming holiday, in fact. In another example, participants didn't expect voice technologies to recognize that when someone is talking about, quote, sugar, that they're not talking about a specific brand, in this case, the Domino's brand of sugar, but instead are talking about diabetes, as black people use the term colloquially to refer to diabetes. So rather than needing to change how they speak or rephrase their question as with the, the Juneteenth example in the previous slide, participants expected voice assistants to be smart enough to mitigate cultural dissonance because it isn't fair to have to do this work themselves. One participant described how these technologies could use something like a dictionary of idioms that black people use, but at a higher level, how could AI-powered systems like voice technologies learn cultural references to quickly correct errors. Participants also spoke of their expectations for more equitable and inclusive representation with voice technologies, yet there was an interesting debate as to what this might actually sound like. Uh, so some participants agreed with one person who said, quote, I feel ethnicity is important and I think all the voices are white. They all sound like white people. I've had enough of white people in my lifetime. And to them, voice representation could mean having voices uh, that have, for example, a Mississippi accent, like one participant said, or, this is my favorite quote, uh, a voice that sounds, quote, young and fine, like the late rapper uh, Tupac Shakur. On the other hand, there were concerns about how to represent black sounding voices well. Um, and one participant said, it's a little dangerous because there is a range of black sounding voices and that it'd be hard to take anything seriously that was uh, duplicating stereotypes of what it sounds like to be black or to be older or both. Which leads us back to our original question of not only what is fair, but what does representation and inclusivity uh, sound like? So from these design workshops and the, the post interviews, we learned that it, it's really about authenticity, so representing the range of one's identity uh, genuinely. So how can systems, not only speech technologies, but other AI systems incorporate authenticity? Well, first, they can allow groups such as black older adults to manually train systems, for example, inputting uh, terms into a dictionary of idioms like one participant suggested. So participants liked this approach because it mitigated privacy concerns with always listening or always learning approaches. And second, although several participants wanted voice technologies to match their speech based on identity characteristics like gender or age or ethnicity, they also described how there should be boundaries of how much identity information users should manually disclose or that machines should be able to learn automatically. So this raises open questions about what the fact in other communities, um, what we think what is best for large scalable systems and instead encourages us to reflect and think about smaller community-based approaches to not only fairness, but also representation and inclusivity so that AI systems can be more authentic. Thank you.
All right, and finally, we have Skin Deep, Investigating Subjectivity and Skin Tone Annotations for Computer Vision Benchmark Datasets with Tiana Barrett. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tiana Barrett, and I'll be presenting on behalf of the rest of the author team, Skin Deep, Investigating Subjectivity and Skin Tone Annotations for Computer Vision Benchmark Datasets. So first, I want to explain how CV people got to skin tone annotations. And it begins and ends with how computer vision has failed black people and also how this failures compound systemic anti-blackness. So given this widespread inequality, CV community has an obligation to resolve these issues. And as talked about in previous talks, uh, race annotations have been a way that fairness performances can be evaluated. However, CV had to confront the limitations of race annotations because in other terms, CV is skin deep. It is not able and understands that it can't recognize and contextualize how deep race is. So as proposed in the Hallmark paper, Gender Shades, skin type is a phenotypic attribute that can be used that's better suited for computer vision and can allow for more objective fairness performance evaluations. However, the CV community continues their idea of being skin deep with their own understanding of skin tone annotations. A lot of them actually ignore the social issues that inject subjectivity in skin tone annotations as well. And here are some. One of the first and primary ways is the measurement itself. So the most popular skin tone annotation scales are the Fitzpatrick and the ITA. And it was adopted by CV practitioners from the dermatology community. But many of these CV people do not know or contend with that these scales were first implicitly made for Caucasians. And it was only until black researchers and researchers of Asian descent called out the need for expanding these scales uh, that we have what we have today. However, CV practitioners have also recognized how limiting these scales were. And so the monk scale that was proposed by Google very recently was an attempt to expand this scale to show the, the need for more expansive representation. However, as to date, this scale has not been publicly evaluated. Another aspect of social subjectivity in skin tone annotations is skin tone itself. As researched by the namesake of the Monk scale, Dr. Monk, uh, he shows that there's a legacy and current practice of how skin tone leads to stratified social statuses in the US and abroad. So given this subject, subjective reality of skin tone annotations, we were interested in first uncovering one, how do CV researchers conduct and report skin tone annotations? And we did that through a literature review. And secondly, we want to understand what are the social factors that can impact the uncertainty of skin tone annotations by human annotators. And we did that with the annotation study. So first to the literature review. We collected a corpus of 50 papers from across notable CV publications and then qualitatively coded them to understand how they report and document and interrogate their skin tone annotation process. And unfortunately, we found that only nine papers actually had any information to qualitatively code. Um, and the vast ma majority actually only had at least one aspect. And larger sense, there was a limited transparency throughout the whole process. And all of them, of these papers that weren't robustly annotated and described, had any uncertainty analysis of their skin tone annotations. And also, a third orthogonal category arose that we found very interesting, considering how skin tone annotations were uh, adopted in order to avoid race. Race was actually embedded in a large majority of papers. Whether it was additional race metadata to contextualize their data set to problematic and ambiguous uh, connections between different ethnicities and different skin tones for data selection, and then straight to very harmful uses of racialized language in place of 
more objective skin tone annotation categories, we saw that there wasn't a real understanding of race and skin tone and how they're associated related, and related to each other, which we found need to be further interrogated. But as you can see in our literature review, there was no real standardization. It was very opaque, and there was no interrogation of the designer annotator positionality throughout any of these procedures. So based off of this, we decided to build our own annotation study to contend with the subjectivity of this process. So first, we wanted to look into the, how scale, the scale type affects uncertainty and agreement using the popular Fitzpatrick scale and the newer and not publicly tested Monk scale. Next, we were interested in the scale ordering, whether the scale that the annotators used was ordered from lighter to darker skin, from left to right, or darker to lighter skin tones. And we also want to dig into how image type may affect uncertainty in the annotators, whether that is using the popular normal facial recognition images or also a very popular task, which is classifying skin, tone, or skin conditions by using medical imagery. And finally, we want to dig into the annotator's positionality by collecting their own skin tone annotation of themselves to understand their implicit bias. So we built our own annotation system that used a continuous annotation scale. We also collected the annotator's own skin tone and followed up with a post survey about how annotators considered race in the skin tone annotation process. So we put up a study on MTurk and also to further increase the diversity of our annotator pool, we did some social network recruiting to eventually get to these findings. So the first finding, uh, how do the scales of Fitzpatrick and Monk scale correlate with each other for measuring skin tone? We actually found that both of these scales are very highly correlated with each other. So that means that the newer Hmong scale could be readily integrated and applied in the skin tone annotation procedure process. And that this expansive scale doesn't actually confuse or make the annotation process more uncertain. Our second question is that we want to understand how does the scale type, ordering of the scale, or image type affect the agreement between annotators? And we actually found that there was higher iterator agreement with the facial recognition data set. And we found that this increased agreement could be due to the annotator experience. It seemed that annotators may have been more comfortable annotating face images, and many provide exit comments that described how they were made uncomfortable by the medical imagery for the skin condition data set. Thirdly, we looked into how the scale type, ordering of the scale, or image type affect the uncertainty of each individual annotator. And this is my ex most exciting finding, I would say, that there is actually lower individual uncertainty when the scale was ordered from darker to lighter. And this goes deeper into how the idea of the social stratification of skin tone is embedded in the perspectives of annotators and designers alike that potentially reconfiguring the ordering when it's normally, when it's ordered from lighter to darker skin tones, when it's ordered from darker to lighter ordering, it may challenge the annotator and allow them to annotate with more intentionality and consider the weight of their annotations. Finally, uh, we looked into how the annotator's own self-reported skin tone or positionality may bias their uncertainty or agreement. And in terms of bias, we presented two um, interesting metrics for bias. First is value bias. And what does this exactly mean? So by value, we want to understand, do the annotators annotate uh, annotations skew more towards their own skin tone or away from their own skin tone? And we actually found that there's a slight bias towards annotating and giving annotation values that are closer to their own skin tone. Secondly, we have the uncertainty bias, and this is essentially the idea of how, how their uncertainty changes based on the image's connection or relative distance from their own skin tone. And we actually found that annotators were more certain in annotating image subjects who were further away from their own skin tone. Uh, we think this is a really 
compelling finding. And with the larger study, we could really grow to understand how annotator positionality can affect their annotations. So I hope you got from this talk, if you are a CV researcher or related to that and you want to use skin annotations, you really have to contend with its subjectivity. And this can be done in these three ways. Firstly, understanding the real relationship race and skin tone have to each other and not conflating them, but also challenging what it means into your design. Secondly, we want to understand how actually as a designer of the annotation process, you can challenge skin tone stratification and the predominant understanding of skin tone hierarchies in your design. And actually, as we saw in the darker to lighter ordering finding, that could actually improve the reliability of your skin tone annotations. And finally, that transparency, documentation at the very minimum, and going into uncertainty reports are really important to understand the downstream effects of how reliable these skin tone annotations are and can actually move towards building computer vision products and models that can better serve people with darker skin tones. And quickly, I want to uh, acknowledge all of these different groups and people. Uh, shout out to the Social Futures Lab at UW, and also the Affected Biometrics Lab at Howard University, and also the Skin Tone Group at um, Google. Thanks for releasing that scale. Um, and yeah, also thank you. And please check out our paper and also our associated repository. And please reach out if you have any questions. All right, we're gonna take Q&A now. We only have a few minutes, so if you have a question, do come up to the microphone here. Um, we also have a volunteer who can run around the microphone. Uh, can I get the uh, authors or the presenters to come up behind me uh, so that we can also speak into the mic? But yes, please come to the microphone up there if you have a question. If not, and while you're thinking, uh, I actually, I have a lot of questions actually for everyone, but I don't know who to start with. Um, so my work is actually a lot on racial categorization and whether or not we should use it at all. Um, I guess from each of your perspectives, different papers have different perspectives on whether or not this sort of use of racial labels is positive or negative. Could each of you or any of you really feel inclined talk about from your work, uh, do you see that the categories must be used and there is a big benefit of it, or should we just not use these categories um, in certain situations? I'm thinking, yeah. Um, I think that it really depends on the context, because for instance, if we are using racial categories in order like um, to use technologies at the border to push back migrants, we don't have to use that. Uh, right, there is like this political uh, context. So I think it it really uh, matters the context where you are embedding like this technology and these racial categories. Because for instance, if on the other hand we are using that uh, to unblock our um, smartphones, maybe it's important that you know we use racial categories in order like to be more accurate. But it really depends on the context. I guess I'll quickly add that I think the main problem has to do with the larger problem of machine learning. My perspective in general is that the Western focus of how you consider race is being forcibly adopted uh, throughout the world and how they do fairness evaluations. So I think that has to be contended with first before you can really decide if it's worth anything, a race annotation. Yes, we have, actually, uh, did you want to respond quickly? Yes. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so I guess, um, yeah, to respond to the question and also clarify, um, I guess, what I was doing in my research, um, I do want to emphasize that we recognize race as a social construct and it doesn't fit nearly into these categories. But in terms of conducting racial disparity or not, um, assessment, you, um, you kind of have to have uh, that definition. Um, so. In our case, our goal is not to reify race as a concept, but to enable the um, <clears throat> race equity assessments. And I think just personally, um, I think this overemphasis 
um, race could distract us from discussions about socioeconomic status and class um, that can, in some cases, arguably more important. Thank you, thank you. All right, we'll take one question here. All right, um, thanks everyone for the great talks. Uh, my question's for uh, Robin Brewer. Um, you mentioned it's an open question on how to incorporate authenticity and inclusivity at the same time, but um, I'm, con I'm questioning or I'm wondering if you have any advice or on how to balance inclusion with this concern about cultural appropriation. Um, my work is on NLP and about uh, black dialects, and there's a lot of concern about as you make these technologies more inclusive, um, there might be more discrimination or cultural appropriation, and I'm just wondering if you have any other insights on that. Yeah, that's a great question, and that's something that we raised to uh, older adults during the workshops, especially once we saw these, not arguments, but differences uh, come about. And one thing that came from that is um, really representing range of black voice, at least in, in this particular case. And so not having just one voice that is the quote-unquote black-sounding voice because then you really get into a lot of um, stereotypes around race and, and, and ethnicity. So um, some suggestions that participants had were, um, you know, maybe offering a, a different voice every time, a different type of black sounding voice every time um, this voice assistant presented some type of response so that people got to understand the range of voice across the, the diaspora. So really thinking about our, is there a range as opposed to a singular um, example of whatever it is that you're thinking about as it, as it relates to um, inclusion and, and representation. All right, I have so many more questions, but we are at time. So thank you all for being here, and I'm going to chat with all of you afterwards. <laughs>